words a little bit to uh, explain a little bit about the Fountain of Youth. As I write this, it is morning in New Byzantium. I am comforted, as I have always been, by the scrape of quill against parchment, something like the scratching of chickens and dust. It seems full of tranquil meaning, though the next dancing rooster will erase all the work of those white and fluttering hands, just as the next scribe with her pumice stone will take up these pages and make room for a decade's worth of the Faison's chalky inundations. I am not entirely at peace with this, but I shall have my comeuppance and must be sanguine in the face of it, for I have scoured my own healthy share of careful calligraphy from donkey skin. It is the natural life cycle of literature, whether I like it or not. I live now in a red minaret whose netted windows let in a kind of glassy light, cut by palm fronds and the tips of quince trees into fitful scales of shadow, scattering this stack of neat lion skin pages. My friend Hedolf cut them for me with much solemnity out of his uncle, who fell into a chasm and spilled out the gift of the fountain into the dust. Adolf's claws were quite sharp enough to the task, but he wept, and the pages are spotted with feline grief. This is not, I think, unapt to my tale. When my pen passes over the stretched and chopped dull tracks of my friend's tears, it goes soft and silent, and so must I. In truth, I do not rightly know where to begin. I want to speak of my childhood. I want to speak of those terrible events that occurred when I was grown. In my head and in my heart, it all happens at once, one moment lying on top of the other, a palimpsest of days. But that is no way to write a book, and if it is a choice between beginning with him or beginning with myself, I must turn my back on the shade of the man who was once my husband and abjure his usual assumption that all things in the firmament are primarily concerned with his person. I am sure he will be affronted. I feel the wind off the persimmon groves chill and bristle. Quiet, John. Quiet, my love. The world existed before you came. We lived. We ate. We even managed to laugh and have a few children before we knew your name. Bells ring slow, low and sweet in the Alcazar. It will be warm today, and the wind will bring roses. When my mother took me to the fountain for the first time, I was ten years of age, and I felt nothing in the world could be hard or cold or implacable. These days we would call our long walk a pilgrimage, but I did not know the word pilgrim then. No one did. What could such a thing possibly mean? But I knew my mother was called Siste, and that she had a waist like a beetle tree and high, small breasts tipped in green eyes like mine. For the blemmy I carry their faces in their chests and have no heads as men do. But we are capable of beauty, whatever you will hear men say. Sissy was beautiful and I loved her. I remember her best bent over her partridge's work, and so too my father working the hoops of laurel wood outside our house, fragrant and white, stretching highballed skins over their curvature. My parents set the pegs true under boughs of champagne flowers. Pale orange shadows flitted on their long, muscled arms, their mouths and their flat stomachs no more than hard, thin lines. I held her hand very tightly as we walked from the city, for you must always walk to the fountain. If your feet are not road filthy when you arrive, you have not suffered enough to be worthy of the water. My mother was very strict about this, stopping every few miles to rub red clay mud onto the soles of my bare feet in case I was not sufficiently squalid. The fountain bubbles and flows quite far from what is now Ephesus Segundus, but was then sweet, gently dilapidated Cheshire, where no one wrote their name without touching my family, our work, our skin. Fountain Road astonished me, such an extraordinary thing for a child to tread, so long, so bright, so loud. Tight as a girl's hair, it curled northward, northward from Cheshire, cutting through spills of spiky cushion grass like brown bones. 
sweaty violet lotus floated on pools of white sand like lake water. Pale green leaves tucked neatly up beneath their petals. Around her ample waist, my mother had tied a belt of books for barter. The spines and boards thudded dully against her hips as we walked, and the smell of dry grass smoked the air. Sisty wore red, too. We all wear red on the Pilgrim Road. A road can be a city, no less than Shershire, no less than Constantinople. The Fountain Road formed a long, wending capital, and we all walked it. And so it became our sweet home, no matter where we'd been born. Every mile was occupied as firmly as War I territory, by Lamia selling venom and lemon cakes by fawns selling respite in their arms, by tigers selling tinctures of their claws and eyelashes, by griffins selling blank-faced idols of chrysolite and cedar. The turban tensivetes, their flat, frozen faces gleaming, let their cheeks drip and melt slowly into amethyst vessels, which were then sold to the peregrinating multitude as holy and magical drafts. At the time we thought them charlatans, but now, when my journeys found in word are long done, think on those cerulean hermits and suppose they never did lie. They let their bodies flow out to ease the throats of the faithful, and that is holiness, even if it was never more than water. We drank those purple files, we paid the sharp-toothed tents event with a novel about a river of ice flowing deep within the earth, peopled with the ghosts of jewel divers who lived upon the pearls that lined the river floor, feasting on them in misery. It was written on sealskin and clapped to Sisti's belt with an ivory buckle. At night, the road stretches on up to forever, up into the mountains lit by countless lanterns, a thin spirally line of lights moving slowly in the near, buffeted by gentle laughter and gentler singing. The lotus fields turn to turmeric and coriander wide and green, and the sharp fresh scent winds among our silver lights, winds among the shadows, winds among a thousand and more arms, swinging in time to a thousand and more steps. When the land grew rocky, we helped each other climb. A man with stag's horns and a chest thin as balsam lifted my mother onto a high ledge dotted with shoe flowers, glinting wrinkled and red in the dark, and placed me beside her in a chaste wing. I carried a bronze-eyed woman's child for several miles, pulling the girl's brain and telling her stories about headless heroes with stomachs like beaten brass. When the turmeric died away and the rocks grudgingly allowed only moss and the occasional lonely plant, we came upon a cart owned by an Estoni, her gigantic nose twitching to catch the faintest aroma on the wind, her prodigious nostrils grazing her own breast. Heart brimmed full of the most extraordinary things, at least to the eye of a girl who had seen only parchment trees and the Shoshaya toy makers' wooden models. The cart woman's nostrils shone, as Tommy have no mounds but eat scent from the air itself, sniffing apples and girl flesh with abandon. Ignoring my impatient mother as a canny merchant will, she showed me a miniature model of the universe, no bigger than a walnut, impossibly intricate all in gems dredged from the bison's glittering inundation. The crystalline spheres, the Estomi said, her voice coming pitched and nasal from the vast tunnels of her nose, with Pendexori in the center bounded by her sea of sand, rendered in topaz, and ringed in jeweled orbits, opal for the moon's circuit gold, of course, for the sun, carbuncle for Mars, emerald for unfeeling Saturn, cosmos on a chain around your neck, excuse me, charming Lemmy, on your waist, and if you'll allow. She turned a tiny silver key in the base of the device, and the spheres began to click and whirl slowly around the plain of Pentaxori, where I could make out a thin sapphire river and specks of carnelian mountains like thin nets. Oh, how shamelessly I begged for that thing, how wickedly I wheedled. Sisti was merciful and indulgent as any mother on a holiday. Quiet as ever and more patient than I deserved, she unhooked a volume from her belt, a dissertation on the matriarchal social structure of the scent farmers of the plains bound in bone boards, and into the bargain the Estomi threw a little ring of lapis and opal which my mother slipped over the stump of her severed finger. 
wore the cosmos on a belt around my waist. Even now as I write, it dangles in my lap like a rosary, the slow clicking of the spheres, and it calms me. The air of the fountain howled thin and high blue as death, giddy. A rock table wedged itself in the ring of mountains like a gem in a terrible crown, and in the rock table sunk a well, deep and cold. The table allowed room for only a few folk at once on that narrow summit, and just as well, for each creature's experience of the fountain remains their own, uninterrupted by the rapture of others. Thick, grassy ropes edge the last stony paths, so our lives might not be entrusted to disloyal feet. Clutching these, clutching the rocks themselves, we climbed, climbed so far, by our fingernails, by our teeth, panting in the ragged wind. Silence loomed so great there, so great and vast, wind and breath alone polishing the faces of the mountain. It was hard. Of course it was hard. All pilgrimage is difficult. Or what use would it be? I crawled up into my mother's lap and laid my thin chest beneath her, between her breasts as we waited for our turn. I felt her lashes on my shoulders. The wind beat at us with both fists, the rope swinging wildly below. Finally, hand over hand, our red skirts snapping against our legs. We balanced on the thinnest of rock spindles, our toes sliding off the shale into the ether. We crossed the well to the fountain. Apples grew there withered and brown, the branches tangled in the masonry of the well. The stones snarled like ugly purple roots, chewing their way out of the ground to make a vaguely well-shaped hole. I thought it looked like the mountain's mouth sneering at me, grimace twisted. The apples slowly swelled as I watched them thickening red and fat and glossy, huge as hearts, even budding a glisten of dew. Then they shriveled, extinguished, sallow and past cider making. As I ran my fingers over their soft, rotten faces, they began to rouse once more, billowing up hard and scarlet. They stuck through the cracks of the well like tongues, Sissy ignored them and knelt by the well, the Oinefesar, a woman in scarlet wool with a swan's head undulating out from her thin and narrow shoulders, the feathers buffeted by wind. The Oinefesar pulled me forward and fixed my hands to the twisted blue-violet stone of the well. I looked within at the roots of the mountain twisted in the pool like jealous fingers, still sharp and violet gray, pulling the water away from a thirsty wind. The fountain was a low puddle and the skulking recalcitrant sister opened up in the crags by a hand I could not imagine. The water oozed thick and oily, globbed with algae and the eggs of improbable mayflies, one corner wriggling with unseen tadpoles. It glowered, bracken green with tracks of brown streaked through it, unmoving, putrid, a slick skin of frothing detritus over the water which had sat motionless for all time at the bottom of a dank hole. I had imagined the water would be so clear, so clear and clean as a gem. I thought it would be so sweet. The Ornifa put her hand over mine, the palest hand I have ever seen, as white as if it had been frozen and her blood turned to frost. Fingernails shone black. Somewhere very far away, she said, her voice playing underneath the wind like a violin bow caught up in a sand dervish. A mountain rises out of a long, wide plain and an ocean of olive trees. Clouds as white as my thumb cover its peak. On top of this mountain lives a crone in a pale dress that falls around her body in crisp folds, like marble cut into the shape of a worm. She lives alone among eleven broken columns, and her eyes shine clear and gray, gray as the tip of her spear, gray as the feathers of the owl that lives in the place where her neck curves into her shoulder. His broad, breathless cheek against hers, talons always gentle on her collarbone. I know her. She likes her olives a little underripe, so they slide hard and oily beneath her tongue. There are people who call this mountain Olympus, but they do not guess that mountains have roots like trees, and the purple stone of Olympus reaches under the earth to 
to join with the gnarled, senescent root system of volcanoes and sea-drowned ranges, foothills and impossible cliffs. Under everything, they knot and wind, whispering as old folk will do, chewing darkness like mint leaves and rumbling about the state of the world. Olympus is far away, my child, but she splays out here, like an oak whose smallest root humps up a mile from any acorn. Sometimes when I press my head to the stone, I hear that crone and her owl spinning olive pits of the little laughing hills. The Ornifa gripped the roots with her strong, pale hands and bent her head into the well. I could not breathe. I had never seen a medical alarm before. The swan maidens who stayed so private and silent when rarely, so rarely, they graced Shishaya with their swaying steps. Her feathers puffed and separated in the wind as she pecked at the apple leaves with a same people who know the name Olympus say there was once a dark-skinned girl named Lita who loved a swan, and who among us should judge the habits of foreigners? They say she bore two sets of twins, two daughters and two sons who burst out of eggs, dripping yolk like yet liquid gold, and between the four of them they broke the world on their beauty. But my friend who piles up olive pits among her columns whispers to me through the mountain roof that Lita had a fifth child who did not have the beauty to fill out recruiters' roles, but the head of a swan and the body of a woman. A poor, lost thing, alone in her egg, without another heartbeat to keep the beast in her at bay. Her sisters loved only each other, and her brothers loved only bronze swords, and so she wandered into the desert, away from her family's burning cities, to the end of the world. The Oynifa turned her arch back to me like a tadpole caught from the mace of and a tadpole caught from the masonry wriggled helplessly on her bill before she slipped it back. Why is the water like that? I asked, bashful, trying to retreat behind my mother's skirts. What do you expect a mountain's blood to look like? My mother laughed. She reached just behind her left hip and unbuckled a book, a compendium of the traditional mating ballads of the seabirds who live on the edge of the Ramal, the dry sea that hurls in sandy waves at their nests on the bowl. The Ornitha took it shyly, her eyes glistening. She ran her icy hands over the feather spine. Such riches. It is so tedious here with nothing to read. She reached for a stone ladle, stained by countless circuits through the water. And I understood why she had told me about Lita. A trade, a story for a story. I did not want to drink from the fountain. It smelled like peat wine far past wholesomeness. My throat closed against it. But suddenly white downy hands pressed my face and my mother's dark mouth whispered soothingly against my shoulder. They squeezed my eyes and lips shut, but between them they coaxed open my mouth. The Oinica lifted a brimming ladle and I am ashamed to say I choked on the sacred waters of the fountain. My body did not want it. My tongue recoiled at the over-rich taste of earth, thick and dank and several slippery, two green lumps of algae like phlegm rolled over my teeth. I choked. It was not at all seemly, and they held me while I spluttered and spilled it onto my pretty red belt. They went with a laugh to tight, fluted sound. I choked the first time, too, she said kindly. There are no more journeys to the fountain, and the turban cart masters are gone. No more graffiti on the mountain walls extolling the truth of it all. Pilgrimage is long and monotonous, and we do it because we must, as children, wash the sink. If there are ropes still atop that mountain, they wave in the scentless wind and help no one to cross the chasms. But I drank there, and so too did all the folk of Pentaxori until after the war, after John. We drank at ten, at twenty, at thirty, the great pole marks of our lives, and once we had forced down a third draft of sickly, fetid, fecund water, we aged never after, and died not, and never died save by violence or accident. And this is not so terrible a trade for three long walks and three foul swallows.